Good afternoon. The Association for Library Collections and Technical Services, ALEX, is a division of the American Library Association and is bringing you the webinar today, You Ought to Be in Pictures, Bringing Streaming Video to Your Library. Sherry Duncan and Erica Peterson from James Madison University will be presenting today. We're using GoToMeeting um, to run this webinar and we'll be um, able to answer your questions at the end of the session. We also are using Twitter and you can communicate with each other, but the coordinators will not be monitoring Twitter. Sherry Duncan is Director of Acquisitions and Cataloging at James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. She oversees the units of monographic services, e-resources and serials management, and cataloging and metadata. Sherry holds degrees in communications and English education from James Madison and a library degree from Texas Women's University. Erica Peterson is Director of Media Resources at James Madison. She holds a library degree at Louisiana State University and previously worked at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette and the University of Virginia. Today's session will cover best practices for selection and use of streaming media, licensing, purchasing and cataloging streaming media, storing and serving content in a locally developed open source system, working with faculty for course use of streaming media, and statistics. So without anything else, let's turn it over to Sherry and Erica. Good afternoon. I'm Sherry Duncan. And I am Erica Peterson. And uh, let us uh, get into our presentation. Uh, James Madison University has been building a streaming video collection since 2003. Uh, using vendor licensing and fair guidelines, the university libraries have added thousands of online videos via collections, multi-title purchases, or title-by-title -title, uh, purchases, either by acquiring the digital files or through in-house digitization. And our goal is to provide faculty and students with access to the resources that they need at the time they need it, in this case, the videos. Um, in acquiring digital rights, we uh, have encountered a number of challenges, of course. Our processes have evolved with technology, license negotiation, and the entry of more vendors into the world of digital rights. But uh, providing streaming video for use within an academic setting continues to be a complex, multi-step process. What you see here is uh, the basic life cycle of a streaming video. It consists of five main components, acquisitions, access, administration, support, and evaluation. And of course, it is a cycle. Uh, in many cases. Each of these components contains numerous elements and what Eric and I will do is uh, attempt to highlight those pieces which are most intricate or unique to streaming video as well as uh, describing some of what we found to be the best practices associated with various aspects of the streaming video collection. Of course, uh, the first step is acquisitions of the digital rights. This process covers selection to receipt and payment and is much the same as the acquisition of other library materials. Uh, there are, however, a few unique elements of which you should be aware. And Erica? And uh, this is Erica and I'm going to talk a little bit about selection. Um, uh, I will say that DVD is still our default format. Um, when an initial request comes in, that's sort of what our go-to format is. And um, we handle streaming access um, sort of on a more case-by-case um, -case basis. Um, 
some of the things that we would base our decision to acquire a, a streaming access for would be uh, faculty recommendations and usage statistics. Um, and I will say that requests are increasing. I would attribute this to people being more familiar with Netflix and iTunes and Amazon Instant and the like. Um, and um, so I'm going to tell you a few common scenarios that we encounter here um, uh, when we're acquiring um, streaming rights on a title-by-title -title basis. Um, one scenario would be a faculty member um, would identify a brand new title for the collection and make a request for it to be streaming at that point. Um, and we would uh, look into the possibility. Another would be a faculty member requesting streaming access for a title that we already have existing in the collection. Maybe um, his class is going to be online now, or um, he feels like use warrants it. Or um, I, as the media librarian or my staff, might determine that a title, because of its heavy usage, um, might warrant having streaming access. Um, another pathway to acquiring streaming access is through subscription collections. This is things like Alexander Street Press's collections or Thumbs on Demand. Um, these generally happen in a little bit of a different way. Usually um, a request would come from a library subject liaison. Now that might be prompted by um, a request from uh, one of her faculty members, but um, it usually comes from, it starts within the library. Um, we would then request a trial. Um, we find that vendors are way more than happy to give you a trial for their product. Um, during the trial period, we would be evaluating it and marketing it to, marketing it to as many um, people around campus as we thought would be interested, um, asking them to evaluate the resource. After, that was or, after the trial period is over, um, if we would determine that um, it would be a resource that we would be interested in acquiring. It would be placed in a queue with a number of other um, digital priorities. So it would be looked at along with acquiring, you know, e-books or um, groups of newspapers or um, access to other online databases. So, of course, the uh, pricing and licensing are the next steps, that the negotiation of both of those, and they will vary greatly depending on what we want to acquire and exactly what we're purchasing. There are generally three ways that, that JMU acquires a streaming video. The first, as Erica said, is the right to uh, purchase the rights to digitize content. The second, to purchase the streaming file and host it locally. Or the third is to, uh, as Erica mentioned, lease a streamed collection. Uh, for digitizing content ourselves, often single titles from smaller producers or distributors um, only have the option to purchase the DVD and the rights to digitize the license for streaming. And these purchases are usually made on a title-by-title -title basis. So the vendor may require an actual license or, as often the case, simply a shrink wrap agreement, which for us usually consists of a statement on the invoice indicating that the library's purchased digital rights. The library then uh, must purchase, produce the digital file in-house, and Erica will describe how we do that. Uh, here shortly. And what we basically do, of course, is strip a copy from the DVD. You may also decide to purchase digital rights for a title or set of titles for which you already own the VHS tape or the DVD. The streaming for these two often have to be done in-house for us. And in this case, you negotiate purchase with the vendor from whom the title was originally purchased or with the current rights holder. Uh, as for acquiring a streaming file, some of the larger vendors have begun offering the option of purchasing that file with or without the accompanying DVD. So we uh, are responsible for hosting and serving the file on our streaming media server, and this would be the same with any library, you would need such a server 
or access to such a server in order to host these streaming files. And when we're purchasing a digital file or files from the vendor, the library will want to retain an archival copy, be it in tangible format, which could be VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, etc., or as the original digital file that you have received or digitized yourself. So you want to make sure that your licensing agreement permits archival rights. That's very important with uh, streaming video in particular when the formats are maybe not as uh, dependable as they are for other resources that uh, libraries use. Typically, the rights to host and present the vendor-created digital file are purchased either for a multi-year renewable period, and for us that's usually been three, five, or ten years, or as a perpetual license, and vendors may offer a long-term renewable license, a perpetual license, or an option of both based on what you're willing to pay. We, if at all possible, prefer the perpetual licensing, of course. Um, in some cases, we will do the five or ten year license if it is a title that we don't foresee um, to be of long term use. What we do uh, do as well is uh, if with the perpetual licensing, we really want that if we're going to host it, our, if we're going to put the uh, time and effort into digitizing it ourselves. <clears throat> the other thing that you really want to do is negotiate a discount whenever possible. Uh, often you're going to be dealing with the vendor for a course of years or for many titles within a single year. And the best way is to get that discount up front. For example, you might say um, offer to purchase five titles if the vendor will give you uh, the rights to five titles that the vendor will give you um, a discount for the rest of the year or for per perpetuity, which of course is the uh, the most preferred <laughs> option. <laughs> Um, you also might negotiate future discounts based on a sliding scale where you purchase less than five titles now, get a certain discount, and then the more you purchase, the more uh, of a discount you receive over the course of your business with the, uh, with the vendor. Then the uh, third option, the the uh, license model for hosted solution is uh, usually presented as a subscription package and uh, it may be a subject collection or an audience collection, i.e. business, social sciences, academic, um, and it could also be as per hundred title purchases, which some larger vendors are able to, to do. Uh, they're also able to offer libraries access to the streaming content from the vendor's uh, own server or elsewhere in the cloud. Some of the vendors have a third-party host for them. And with these collections, tools are often included that uh, provide uh, extra benefit to, to your users. These tools consist of um, mashups, um, organizing clips for class use and comparing videos or uh, other features. Once a license has been negotiated and the product ordered, the next step is of course the receipt and payment. Uh, as with any um, product, this process for digital rights, however, what does require some adaptation of, on the part of your staff and in your workflows. Uh, you might receive an invoice for the digital rights of a title that you already own, and that's all you get. 
because you you aren't getting a physical copy. You already have a physical copy in house. Uh, either you will have a license on file allowing digitization of that tangible copy or a statement on the invoice will indicate permission for the library to digitize that video. In either case, again, you never receive a, a, the physical material because you've already got it. Or you may order just the digital rights and the same scenario will occur. So we have to maintain audit trails, workflows, and other tracking mechanisms to ensure that the library has a tangible copy of the video that is of sufficient quality to digitize if that's what you're doing. Uh, permission to digitize has been granted. A quality digital copy has to be created if we're talking about, again, creating digi uh, a digital copy or the copy that is received has to be of sufficient quality. Uh, the, the streamed video has to be accessible to your patrons and easily viewable. It has to uh, stream properly. And all of our above, all of our steps are recorded in uh, our electronic resource management system. Uh, you may do so in an ILS, a database, a paper file, or some combination of these. If a vendor provides a digital, uh, digital file, it may be on a DVD, uh, a USB, via FTP server, or uh, via hard drive. Your acquisition staff have to know how to handle that material and to check it or if not within your receiving and acquisition staff, media resources staff need to check that material to make sure that it's viable and that it's what was agreed upon, that it is of good quality and communicate that to your acquisition staff. The, the hosted uh, platform uh, is much easier because um, you set that up as you do any electronic resource in most cases where you have an IP uh, address and uh, you provide that IP range to your vendor. Then you set up the uh, uh, platform options and check access and you should be good to go. Erica? All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our digitization and streaming process. Um, so I'll just reiterate what Sherry said, which is if at all possible you should try to negotiate for a digital file from uh, the vendor, uh, but sometimes that's just not possible, um, either because you need a very quick turnaround or they just don't offer that service. So. Um, you'll probably need some kind of a setup, an in-house digitization setup, and I'm going to show you um, just how easy that can be. So here is our super fancy um, uh, digitization setup, uh, our key man, Billy Brett, um, and his uh, top of the line workstation. So this is how it's set up. Um, uh, what he has is a PC with a DVD drive in it. He's ripping right from the DVD um, drive in his computer. There's also a VHS deck, as you can see here, um, and that is plugged into a DV deck. And um, the, DVD, the DV deck goes then out to the PC. So that's all there is to it. Um, the software that we're using is uh, VIDI, V-I-D-I, for um, ripping VHS and uh, Handbrake, which um, many of you might know um, for ripping DVD. So once we have those digital files, they're then uploaded into the OVC. That stands for the Online Video Collection. That's the video portion of MDIP, which stands for the Madison Digital Image Database. That's um, an in-house developed open source software that many of you might be familiar with, and that's where uh, all of our in-house created um, digital video content, content lives. 
as well as any um, content individually licensed from a vendor. Of course, um, any sort of subscription packages we have, we're not hosting those locally, but um, everything else would be hosted inside the OVC and MDIB. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about discovery. So once you have all this great stuff, it's really helpful if your users actually know how to get to it. So I'm going to exit out of my um, Prezi here. Hopefully that's not going to cause any problems. You'll all be able to see now um, the uh, main page of our library's um, home screen. And uh, the videos are accessible both through um, LEO, the library's catalog system, and from our discovery tool, which is EBSCO. So I'm going to just show you really briefly how those um, both look. So I'm going to be looking for a title which actually exists in two different places. We have an individual streaming license for the title, and also we have access to this title through Films On Demand. Um, so that's a little bit of a unique situation for this title, but it does come up. So um, I just looked for the title, Sick in America. I'm going to um, click on this record, connect to online video. And here is access to that video um, through Films on Demand. This was actually a segment of um, the show 2020. Okay, so that's that. And now we'll just go back to the library's homepage. And we're going to look for it through um, discovery service. our discovery service. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> Well, it, it, <laughs> if you notice, the other version of the film was directly <laughs> below the one that Erica clicked on in the catalog. That's correct. And actually, I think I actually clicked on the one. Oh, actually, I did the wrong thing. I actually clicked on um, the Films on Demand title twice. Uh, it changes um, how it shows up in the catalog uh, sometimes. I'm just going to show you that one again through Leo. So you can see... Um, uh, access through um, MDIP. online. Yeah, MDIP. Oh, well, now this one is taking me to. I'm having a little bit of a problem. I think I'm having some brain problems today. Here we go. <laughs> I just clicked on the wrong file. It's all my fault. <laughs> I sent Erica into a panic by showing up right at the last minute. I know. I don't know what to do with myself today. So I'm authenticating into MDED, um, and this is where uh, uh, it's linked us now to, as you can see, OVC. But this is just a part of um, MDED, Madison Digital Image Database. and um, That is an open source uh, software that was created by uh, staff here at JMU, by programmers here, but is available to any library and they do uh, provide some community support for this product. And here goes John Stossel in 2020. Ah, uh, there he is. Okay, so that's how that looks and works. Um, and uh, next up, Sherry is going to talk a little bit about um, ERM. So I'm just going to get back here into our Prezi, and we're good to go. So once you have access, to your digital file, your streaming file, then you uh, have to administer it. And that's a continual process. Um, what is most important for us, the way that we administer uh, our electronic resources of any type, as I noted before, is through our electronic resource management system. We happen to have innovative product, but uh, there are many different ways of maintaining uh, the information that you need to administer digital uh, files, digital videos. What we do is enter all of our administrative, technical, and licensing metadata for all of our electronic resources, including streaming video, into our ERM, and we can flag the resource for a renewal period, if that happens to be the case, if it's one of our five or ten year or even three year resources, or if it's a hosted solution such as uh, the Films on Demand. 
and then the system will uh, distribute a tickler. It'll send an email to whomever needs to know that that resource is up for renewal or to one of our staff members who will then notify anyone that, that needs to know that those resources are up for renewal. And that has saved us a lot of time and headache in not having to uh, manually maintain those multi-year contracts. We can also put rights notations and discount commitments, um, copies of the invoices that actually say that we have permissions to permission to digitize this video, as well as, of course, the license itself. Um, and all of any email confirmations, any email correspondence, all of that's easily findable through our ERM. We also, through our ERM system, uh, display usage guidelines for the uh, faculty and students so they don't have any questions as to uh, what they can or cannot do with a video. So next, we, uh, once we have ERM in place, in, we uh, provide support, troubleshoot issues with streaming media can impact several areas of the library, depending on any number of factors, um, from whether or not the uh, subscription is current, if it's a hosted resource, to um, whether the catalog record is correct, the URL is the correct one, if MDID uh, is having an issue, if it's down, or if the, the digital file has actually become corrupt. And what we use to track all of this and for reporting purposes, instead of a staff member in public services trying to determine who they should contact is the uh, tech support form that Erica has pulled up. Uh, as you can see, we enter uh, who is reporting the issue uh, and where they're located. There's a whole host of options on the right side of the page uh, that the user, the staff member, uh, liaison librarian, whomever can choose from. For example, they might choose that uh, they're having a problem with uh, LEO, which is our catalog, Millennium, and that problem may turn out to be a digital video problem. That the catalog record is correct, the URL within the catalog is correct, but the file has been corrupted or has been moved. It doesn't often happen. Uh, we've had very good success with our digital videos, whether they're video files that we've created in-house or whether they're files that we've received from the vendor and are hosting. Um, so we don't have many issues reported, but we do occasionally. And because of this form, again, uh, people don't have to think about who to report it to. The form itself sends an email with all of the pertinent information to a number of people in different areas. People in acquisitions, uh, cataloging, media resources, and systems all receive this uh, report of a problem. And there are usually backups in each area as well. So there's no question whoever received the people that receive the report can easily identify who's the main uh, respondent and they will uh, send out an email. At the same time, this form populates a database where everyone that's on the form can track what the status is of the, the call. Oh, yeah. We, got behind I got behind a little bit. Sorry there. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the hardware and software requirements. Um, uh, as you can imagine, um, 
the local hosting part is the most robust. Um, if you're talking about subscription packages like Films on Demand, most of the um, hardware and software requirements are on the vendor side. You would be, need to assure that your campus can handle the bandwidth. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what is behind Ended. Currently, we're locally hosting about 2,800 videos, and that's on about 1.72 terabytes of space. Um, that's the OVC and MDED. Um, all of these files are in MPEG-4 format in both high and low bandwidth versions, um, and we're delivering those through software called Flow Player. Um, so uh, I can say a little bit on some upcoming technology coming from vendors. Um, uh, you know, of course, they, they try to keep some of the, what they've got in the work secret. Um, but I do know that um, mobile device compatibility is a big thing that they're talking about and dealing with right now. I think that they all recognize that that's the future of how users are going to be accessing their content, and they're moving as quickly as they can to be delivering it that way. Um, and dynamic bitrate switching, so um, users aren't having to decide whether or not they want a high or low bandwidth version of a file, but it's determining at any given moment what a user is capable of handling. <clears throat> so uh, things to consider if you're getting into this for the first time um, is just how much staff and digital storage uh, you can provide. Do you have the staff time and know-how? and um, the digital capacity be, to be hosting uh, uh, streaming video locally. Um, is the bandwidth, like I said, is the bandwidth of your university su to, is it sufficient to be both um, streaming locally hosted files and streaming files delivered by a vendor? Um, how much are your students and faculty using mobile? Um, uh, and uh, is your vendor able to accommodate that? And are you able to accommodate that? Um, will your faculty be wanting to stream these things to their classroom? Um, that can cause you to think about a whole other um, list of possibilities about the reliability of the files. Um, are they going to be wanting to include these in a course management system? And if they are, are they going to be using clips? Or are they going to be using the entire film? And can a vendor and can you accommodate those things? Um, and also, do you have the rights to uh, clip and mash up um, the videos that you have obtained from a vendor, either stuff that you're locally hosting or um, things that you're acquiring um, from a software package? Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about evaluating this. Um, some of this is uh, anecdotal um, because statistics right now are a little bit hard to uh, figure out. Everything that the vendors give you is a little bit different from um, what the other vendor gives you and from a little bit different from what you're keeping for yourself. Though I will say that streaming video is extremely popular. Our students love to be able to access content that way, and um, faculty love being giving that option to their students. Um, I would say, I, uh, anecdotally, that um, titles that are being accessed through our subscription packages, uh, the heavily used titles are a fairly small subset of what the entire package contains. So, there's a hundred or so films on demand titles that are accessed extremely heavily um, and then a vast majority that have never been accessed at all. So, I mean, depending on what kind of standards you want to have, you can say, well, that's widely successful, you know, um, this film has been accessed 6,000 times, or you can say, this is terrible, only 1% of all of the total files have been accessed at all. And we don't know how they're being accessed. Uh we still need to do some evaluation on that, uh, whether they're being accessed through our catalog. We do have all of the film's records in the catalog, or if they're being accessed through our discovery service, or directly from the, the uh, database website. That's right. Um, and I also wanted to say a little thing about something that we're kind of struggling with, is, what, is how to think about um, how streaming video compares to access to our physical collection. And I don't, I haven't come up with a good way yet of um, a good way to think about it. Um, and this is the problem. So let's say you have the same 
uh, the same film two different ways. You have a physical copy in the library and you have a copy, a streaming copy. And the faculty member puts this item on reserve. And um, one student in the class comes in and uh, checks out your film, uh, the physical copy, the DVD from the library, and they take it home and start it and then stop it and go to the bathroom and then start it up again and then call their mom and then fall asleep and then start it again. And, and then they uh, don't finish it until they bring it to school within the next day and they watch a little bit of it before class and uh, then a little bit uh, after class and then they turn it in. Well, that's going to show up in your system as one circulation. But a similar kind of use of a digital file might show up as multiple, multiple accesses. So if uh, they're looking up the film to find out where it is, clicking on it and not finishing it, going home, starting it, not finishing it, pausing it, reloading it, clicking away from it, you know, all of those things, that could show up as being accessed 10, 15, 20 times to the single circulation that you had um, from the physical copy in your collection. So I think that um, I'm anticipating a future pushback to my physical collection when people say, but see, look at how many times this streaming copy has been accessed and, you know, this physical copy has only circulated 50 times and this one is circulated, the online version has been viewed 6,000 times and having to say, well, I don't think those two things, uh, it's not example, exactly apples to apple comparison. So um, the future. Uh, I think that uh, streaming is going to uh, continue, uh, but uh, I'm sure all of you are really tired of hearing this thing. So I've been being a media librarian now for about 12 years, let's say. And so uh, since the very first day I walked into a library, somebody has said to me, but everything's going to be streaming in five years. I think it's probably the same if you're dealing with books, you know. Oh, all of these collections are going to be online in five years anyway. Well, here we are uh, five, 10, 15 years later, and guess what? It's still not all streaming. So, um, you know, call me a cynic, but I don't think that ever it's going to all be streaming. Um, it's just not. It's just really not a feasible thing to think about. Um, but it is going to increase and increase and increase. And um, Netflix is going to increase demand. I mean, Netflix and services like that are going to increase demand. Um, and they're going to continue to acquire content. Um, uh, this is really great because it reduces the speed of growth of your physical collection. And uh, physical collection space is at a premium. Um, however, it is a big investment in storage and management, and it can be a really big burden on tech infrastructure, too. Um, I recently heard from one of the IT people on our campus that 90% of all of James Madison University's net traffic is Netflix. So um, I see two big potentials um, in the market. This is just me, but I think that more and more distributors are going to be releasing subscription packages. I think services like Films on Demand are going to be increasing. Um, I think that this is really good because it reaches out to a larger demographic um, on campus um, instead of doing a title by title licensing. Um, uh, you're going to be able to license, you know, huge numbers of titles and maybe people who wouldn't think there would be film out there for them are going to be able to find it. Um, it's also a lot easier to manage. You're not trying to negotiate each individual thing with each individual vendor. But they're very expensive, um, and you lose control over your content. They determine what you do and don't have access to, and they lose the streaming rights to films in their catalog. And if it's something that a faculty member relies on, then you can lose access to it. So. Um, I think that you know we're really going to have to look at maintaining our rights in perpetuity or always making sure we maintain a physical copy if it's something that you know really is essential to um, faculty and student use. Um, another possibility I see is that Netflix and services like Netflix, like Amazon Instant, um, they're already very widely used and they're offering more and more academic content every day. Um, so uh, having models partnering with um, these services or um, encouraging um, all of the students on your campus to have subscriptions to these services, that's, I think, becoming a likely possibility. Um, 
the, po the plus side to this is that users are already really familiar with these services um, and they're really focused on having nice, easy, uh, friendly to use user interfaces. Um, I think that um, we can hope that they're going to be developing more favorable campus licenses. Um, but the bad side, of course, is that these things aren't archives, that they're in the business of providing the content that makes them the most money. Um, and titles can be removed um, because they've lost access to them or because they're no longer profitable. And then you're in the same situation if it's something that um, a faculty member is really depending on, then poof, there it goes, right in the middle of the semester. So um, those are some of my crystal ball predictions. And uh, that ends uh, the formal part of our presentation. And so now we would be happy to take any questions from you. OK, we have two questions. The first one is, um, what are you using for your ERM? We're using inter Innovative Interfaces uh, ERM system. And we enter okay. the information in there just like for streaming videos, just as we do for any electronic resource. So you should be able to use um, serial solutions or your own ILS systems, ERM, or any of the products that are out there to track your uh, digital video the same way that you would track your other electronic resources. Okay, the next question is, please talk about cataloging. Do vendors supply records? Can you find records in OCLC? We do any number, of any combination of, of what you've just described. For the large collections, such as the Films on Demand, video supply records, or uh, vendors supply records, excuse me, and they update those records quarterly to uh, remove content from the system and actually add content. Uh, for individual title by title, we do have, find some records on OCLC, a fair amount, and we do some original cataloging in-house. Next question is, what's your annual budget? We have uh, just under a $4 million materials budget total of those. Um, this past year we had $40,000 for media, including streaming and tangible media. And then we uh, also put an additional $20,000 to that fund for uh, beefing up a specific collection here in the library. Okay. How many vendors have offered a perpetual license option? More and more are. The major ones do. Um, the one large one in the room, which is uh, <laughs> Films Media Group, would prefer to see everyone go to their Films On Demand product, I believe. But we have uh, gotten uh, multi-year licenses out of them and also some perpetual licenses. Uh, the others, um, large ones, are beginning to offer perpetual licenses. And even some of the smaller uh, ones and twos production companies will give you a perpetual license with the purchase of the video. Uh, you just have to be willing to go out there and, and approach the vendor in many cases. They don't advertise it. So you have to approach the vendor and push for that perpetual license. But we've been pretty successful in what we purchase in gaining perpetual license for the licenses for them. And something that I think um, I've seen in the course of, like, say, the last five or six years when streaming has really started to be an issue is, Five years ago, when you were contacting vendors and saying you were interested in streaming and uh, what were they going to charge you and what were the, uh, their terms, you know, they didn't know. They had just started this too. And so some of them were a lot more willing to kind of sign over the farm to you back then than they are now. So I think that I've seen um, 
uh, a little bit more savvy on the part of the vendors in as far as um, uh, having licenses ready to go and having terms ready to go and sometimes they don't advertise necessarily that they will do in perpetuity they'll tell you five years or they'll tell you ten years um, but the other thing too I think is that um, the vendors um, are working with licenses of their own so they are dealing with the uh, the filmmaker and the filmmakers are a lot more savvy now and are limiting the amount of time that vendors have to license their product for streaming. So sometimes as much as they might love to give you perpetual access, they just don't have the right to. And so there have been a few recently, Erica was just asking about three uh, just today and we've gone directly to the uh, production company's website bypassing the vendor to uh, actually ask them about digital rights. One of those had it very uh, prominently advertised on the page that for $250 you got the DVD plus a five-year license. Uh, then if you approach them, they may or may not be willing to give us a perpetual license, but we'll certainly try. The other two simply advertise DVD with performing rights, which of course doesn't help us with the streaming piece of it. So we're having to approach them individually to see if we can negotiate uh, digital, uh, the rights to uh, stream those videos. And it does take some time. It uh, takes someone that can devote the time to work with each individual vendor for those that aren't the larger uh, vendors that you're used to working with. Okay, we have about 20 more questions, Ooh. so um, um, you've created a lot of um, interest. How right, much? Yes, no, no, yes. yes. <laughs> well, uh, you, they will be answered offline, but um, let me see how many of them. This is good, yes. right? <laughs> That's great. How much training does it take to transfer a VHS or a DVD to a streaming file, and could a student worker do it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, you want somebody who knows what they're doing to get you set up, um, and then after that, it's really darn easy. Um, there are very rare occasions when um, um, something doesn't really work right and or, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about like if the, if the VHS maybe wasn't in NTSC format, if it was CCAM or PAL, um, you would need special equipment and that might not be something a student would be up for, but, um, but the majority of it is quite easy to use. So if you have a student who's not afraid of technology, um, then, and you have a good setup, it's pretty darn easy. And I can attest to that because in 2003, when we purchased digital rights to a bulk of our collection and streamed those ourselves in-house, they were on VHS, most of them, at that time, and a student did most of the 300 videos yeah. that we stream. Well, and let's face it, most of them are probably ripping things left and right on their own. We just uh, put our fingers in our ears and go la 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 when they start to talk about it. So, Okay. Do you market your streaming videos so your users know to come to MDID instead of Netflix or YouTube? Um, we do, but a lot of the marketing um, is targeted toward the faculty members. So um, uh, a student would have to probably accidentally they would have to be searching the Leo catalog or they would have to be searching a discovery tool um, uh, to come across the stuff that's in MDID or OVC. We have marketed um, uh, individual titles that we've acquired. So every time we get a new batch of um, sexy new streaming licenses, we kind of cull through them and find the ones we think have the best appeal. And we advertise those on the digital signage in the library and we'll put um, little ads on the um, library's website for those individual titles. And of course we market Films on Demand and Alexander Street Press or whenever we get new subscription packages, we, pack, we uh, market those. Um, but if a faculty member has a streaming assignment for class, 
um, we're kind of relying on them to make sure that their students um, uh, know where to go to it. And I'm sure that there are plenty of them that are uh, stumbling into Netflix too. So are you using MDID OVC to deliver streaming reserves? If so, how is that working? It's working great. Um, we, uh, if the title is In Films on Demand or Alexander Street Press, we're just um, uh, giving the link to the faculty and letting them embed that in their course management system. Um, if they have a request for, um, if a faculty member is requesting something from the OVC, same deal. We just uh, give them a direct link that they can um, uh, plop into. We use Blackboard. They can pop into Blackboard, and um, the students can uh, 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 link in to the OVC. It's not embeddable right now. But the OVC is under authentication, mm -hmm. so anything that we stream is behind uh, authentication. And I think that we saw a huge drop in um, the number of uh, physical reserves that we had when we started streaming, um, and I think that that's leveled off. So I think that the faculty who really, really wanted streaming now, they mostly have what they want, um, and the faculty who don't really care about it or um, uh, or it's just not available to them for whatever reason, um, they have their physical reserves and that seems to be working fine. But we do regularly get questions from faculty, can we stream this or stream that? And often it's a newer title that we've not recently acquired in mm -hmm. DVD format. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the name of the software which handles your locally hosted titles? It's MDED. It's an MDED Madison Digital Image Database, if that's the question. And OVC Online Video Collection is just a subset of MDED. The, okay. Our MDED also contains our Art Images Database. Right. And many other image collections that are specific to faculty members and classes. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the proportion of feature films to educational documentaries in your streaming collection? How did the how did getting the digital rights compare between the two? Well, until Erica got here. <laughs> <laughs> I like feature films. Um, we probably aren't streaming. Well, I mean, popular, um, streaming popular titles is still just not really something we can do. Um, so if a faculty member wants us to stream Twilight, probably that's not going to happen. I mean, there would have to be, like, some really compelling cases. It would have to be short clips or it would have to be uh, distance ed or other requirements for that. Um, the feature films that we have um, streaming access to are feature films from um, these smaller distributors. So feature films that are distributed through Women Make Movies or feature films who are distributed through California Newsreel mm -hmm. or things like that. So Now there is a feature film distributor out there. Uh, it's Swank. And they have a very different licensing model where you purchase the rights to, say, 50 to 100 uh, videos, and then uh, the faculty members use those. And once you've used those up, you have to purchase another batch. So if anyone's truly interested in streaming video, Swank is the only, one, only uh, vendor out there that does that currently. But it's a very different model than uh, we normally see with streaming. Right. Okay. How many staff members or librarians do you have working on streaming videos? Um, in acquisitions, we have one uh, that does most of the ordering. I do the licensing, and I'm a librarian. Uh, then we have a second. Uh, staff member in eResources that maintains the ERM information, and she does that for any of our electronic resources. Uh, we have a backup in, e in our electronic resources division and also in our acquisitions unit that can take over for either one of those two. So I would say um, approximately three FTE. Yeah. 
In media resources, um, I would say there are three FTE and one part-time that are involved in working with the streaming collection. And, um, but that's all, you know, just part of our job. So I'm a librarian and I work with this, but you know, it's a, it's a very small percentage of the total amount of my day that mm -hmm. I might spend doing this. The person who use, does it the most would be Billy, who does our digitization. Um, and I would still say it's maybe, you know, 10% of his time, 20% of his time at the most. And then uh, Andreas Knab is the person who oversees um, the MDID um, server and uh, database. Um, he's a programmer. And I'm not really sure how much he might say of his time is spent. Um, of course, we use MDID for many other reasons, so sure, right. a big portion of his time is spent on MDID right. developing. Yeah. 100 percent of his time is MDID, but um, dealing with streaming video, I would say half a percent. Everything is so automated, mm -hmm. he hardly ever has to touch our stuff. So. Right. <clears throat> is the library and subscribing to Netflix? And they said, I was under the impression they discouraged this now. Um, we are not subscribing to Netflix. We did do a trial access n a number of years ago, and that was uh, a, before they s began discouraging it, and it just wasn't something that was going to work for us. I know the university yeah. also looked into a uh, institutional access for students here a couple of years ago, and it wasn't viable either. But I would get, I couldn't guess what percentage of our students come with either their own Netflix accounts or access to their parents' Netflix mm -hmm. accounts, but I would guess that it is almost as close to 100% as it could possibly be. Mm -hmm. So it, it's trying to convince the faculty members that their students really do have that much access to Netflix, but um, it's clearly a, uh, there, it's clearly being used a lot on campus. Okay, here's the next one. Where are the archival MPEG-4s preserved? Are they stored with attached metadata? They are. Um, that might be something better to follow up with on offline, because I could get you a lot more information about um, hardware specifications and stuff like that offline. Okay. But they are stored with attached metadata. OK. Have you done any archiving of video directly from the web, for example, YouTube? videos in order to preserve them? Oh, you know, not in any robust sort of way. We've had a very occasional um, request for faculty who need to use something that's only available on YouTube for their class for the, fall, the you know, upcoming semester, and we do what we need to do to make sure that they can have access to it for that period of time, but we're not archiving those files or putting them in our catalog or anything like that. What's the quality of your strained files? How high is the streaming bit rate? Any issues with customers accessing off-campus? Well, they are allowed off-campus access if they're authenticated. So they can use MDID if they're going in through the proxy or VPN client. So that's no problem. And we haven't had problems, as far as we know, of any uh, on -off unauthorized access or being downloaded. And I don't know, I think 128 for high and 56 for low, mm -hmm. is that right, Sherry? Yes, and for the most part, uh, unless someone is accessing off campus with a dial-in, the access rates, or the download rates, are, or streaming rates are very, right. very good. If you can include that one in the offline ones, then I can double check on that. I believe they'll all be offered here because we're not making any headway with the questions. They're just <laughs> and we have about a minute left. Okay. How many IT staff do you have supporting streaming video? Just, mm, just Andreas. Yeah, one. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a you know there's a small group of people who work um, within bid because there's um, Kevin Hag right, and. But but they don't do anything except back him up mainly. Yeah, right. Mainly one full time. And again, he does other things. No, we have no one person devoted to streaming video. <laughs> okay. 
Do you have any access to major Hollywood films? Um, not through any online subscription services like Swank. We don't have, we're not using the Swank service right now. Um, and the, uh, the Hollywood films that we have, we all just have, we have in our physical collection. Okay. And like I said, there are some, you know, very rare, rare, rare circumstances where we might digitize a Hollywood film. Um, but that would be because there was an extremely compelling case because there was, um, it's needed for um, a distance ed class or we're just making small clips of the film, but um, we don't have any mass access to it. Okay, I'm going to have to cut you off. Okay. Okay, so um, I need to get back to my slides. I need the presenter change. Great. The ELECTS Continuing Education Committee is always looking for um, future webinars. And um, there's a link on this, um, on this PowerPoint slide that um, gives you the, the uh, address. It's also on the website. And um, the calendar, we do a webinar every Wednesday, except during ALA season. And the calendar is also on the ELECTS website. And I have here what um, some of the webinars that are coming in April and May, um, particularly with Preservation Week. Um, there's also some things I'm using the H&P Library of uh, Congress uh, classification schemes and some more on RDA. So again, I want to um, be the first to thank Erica and Sherry for their work today, and there's some contact information here. And um, I would really encourage all of you to continuing, continue to looking at the ELEX website for other learning opportunities. Thank you. <laughs>